Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Michael Freeston. I am Director of Quality Improvement uh, at the Preschool Learning Alliance, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar, Moving On and Starting Big School Managing Transitions. The leader of today's session is Melanie Pilcher. Good afternoon. Quality and Standards Manager with us here at the Alliance. Um, just by way of starting, for those of you who've attended our sessions in the past, you will notice that we have a new branding arrangement. We have linked uh, the production of webinars now with a new initiative that the Alliance has launched, which I hope you've heard of. It's for all practitioners, whether they are members of the Preschool Learning Alliance or not. It's called Smart PD, and it's an innovative approach to professional development, whereas rather than us telling you what we feel you need in terms of work by way of professional development, um, you tell us. Um, our training centre based down in Tunbridge is becoming a locus of a place where um, individual conversations can, with a consultant, a qualified information advice and guidance consultant, can lead to the development of a, a personalised professional development programme, either for your whole setting or for you as an individual. Um, if you'd like more information on Smart PD, um, I'd invite you to visit the Preschool Learning Alliance website, www.pre-school.org.uk forward slash Smart PD, and it will give you the information there. Um, we'll speak more about that when we get towards the end of the program, but also to say that for those of you who missed last month's um, webinar on the essential importance of physical activity, the, uh, the recording is available and also we have started to introduce a saleable resource pack which supports each of the webinars. Um, this allows you to um, deliver the session yourself back in your setting to your staff, um, either with the recording that we produced or running a session within one of your inset days. Uh, and the cost of those resources is £15 for members and £20 for non-members. Thank you, Melanie. You'd think I'd remember that bit. I, I, I do apologise for that. We'll speak more about that as we go through. And the other thing I would like to say, just to draw your attention to it, is that the Smart PD innovative approach has been, first of all, endorsed by CASH as one of their endorsed learning programmes, which we're very uh, grateful of, and it demonstrates the quality of the process, but also has been listed as a finalist in the Nursery World Awards for the resources for preschool practitioners, early use practitioners. So I would commend it to you. That's the sales pitch done for the session. Um, I will now start with the formal introduction to the process. Um, for those of you who are new to webinars uh, with the Alliance, just a word on the structure, don't be afraid of them. They are very similar to a normal seminar, but instead of being in a classroom, uh, you're listening, attending on the web. We aim to usually uh, offer a 15 to 20 minute presentation and then do allow any time up to about half an hour uh, for any comments or questions that, are, that may arise. But what we've learned is that actually these conversations work best if there's a dialogue. So if any um, questions or comments come into your mind as Melanie goes through um, the presentation, um, my role is to take your questions typed into the box and to drop them in seamlessly into our discussion. It's not often seamless, I have to say, but um, take them from there. that's the box you should have on your screen. Um, and it always says this, that you can ask them in any question, any language you want. We prefer them in English. Um, otherwise, it, <laughs> we couldn't guarantee what we were replying. Um, and with that, I shall hand over to Melanie. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, good afternoon again, everyone. And um, this is a subject that's timely for all of us. Um, we're now getting to that time of year when we're preparing to say goodbye to a cohort of children and to begin to welcome next term's children. And in amongst all of this, the most important thing that we strive for is consistency and stability for the children that we have been looking after and will be looking after in the future. Uh, but transition is, of course, um, inevitable. And there are times in life when we must all make transitions. 
Uh, and I just wanted to spend a little bit of time reflecting on those times. For parents and their children, the first is usually the time when they begin to use childcare in the first place. And all the associated concerns about whether they're doing the right thing, and then separation anxiety for both the child and the parent. So we give a lot of thought to how we settle children in our settings, how we make those important relationships with their parents as key persons. And the key person-parent relationship is so important because it supports every transition that is to come whilst those children are with you. We strive to establish child starting points so that we can meet their individual needs and create that sense of security within a safe environment that enables our children to learn, grow and develop to their full potential. The first transition from home to childcare is recognised as being one of many critical points in a child's learning and development. The EYFS recognises this and places emphasis on the areas that I've mentioned above, most of which make up a setting in procedure that I would say every setting should have. And this should include starting points, the role of the key person, and the importance of positive relationships. What we don't always do is give the process adequate time often due to pressures on parents to get back to work, or the assumption that a child will not need much time to settle, particularly if this is not the first time they've been left in the cares of, the, of, other, of others. What we know at the Alliance is that when children have not had time to settle into a new environment and make important attachments with their carers, they're more likely to display separation anxiety. They may be distressed unwilling or unable to join in with activities and lack confidence. This in turn affects their ability to cope with change in their formative years, which is why I'm giving talking about it now in this webinar plenty of time, because the children have not been properly settled from the outset and display behaviours that indicate this to be so are likely to struggle with other transitions. Of course, lots of transitions happen within a setting. We have children moving on, moving up to other rooms, changes in key person. Some children move settings, some children move between settings in the course of their early years experience, maybe from childminder to nursery, from nursery to out of school and so on. But how we deal with these transitions is absolutely paramount. Good communication, change management and time are essential. So, in the EYFS, the term school readiness is implicit, but the term can be prob problematic. And with the final transition to school, of course, what we're talking about, what we're trying to, to aim for, is school readiness. But there are many different views about what school readiness actually looks like. And I found one um, just the other day, which is public health's definition of school readiness, one that I haven't come across before. Is that in the Mara report? I think yes, it was. Yes. Uh, thank you, Michael. And what they talk about is some very sort of practical physical development things, children having good oral health, um, developing motor control and balance for a range of physical activities, children being independent in eating, well-nourished and normal weight, and have received all their childhood immunizations. And then you'll see at the bottom of the slide there, I've put some of the other things that start to creep in to that def definition, which are the school readiness points that we would more readily recognize. School readiness is also measured by how prepared a child is to succeed in school, cognitively, socially, and emotionally. The good level of development, GLT, is used to assess school readiness by public health in England, and children are defined as having reached a GLD at the end of the early years foundation stage, if they've achieved at least the expected level in the early learning goals. In, in the prime areas of learning, such as personal, social, emotional development, physical development, and communication language, and in the specific areas of maths and literacy. But we know that school readiness starts at birth with the support of parents and caregivers, when young children acquire the social and emotional skills, the knowledge and attitudes that are necessary for success in school and school life. School readiness at the age of five has a strong impact on children's um, future development. 
And I like the more rounded definition that certainly sits well with our core beliefs and values and is actually found in Ofsted's report, Are You Ready? This includes the skills of listening, being able to separate from parents, showing interest and paying attention, which I argue is different to sitting still and listening, communicating what makes them who they are and including relevant factors in their life. Being able to interact with adults and their peers, a focus and an interest in the world around them and their work. Being able to make observations, notice things and ask questions. In other words, the characteristics of effective learning have been supported, not suppressed in their early years. Children's innate curiosity has been nurtured and they start school with that curiosity, with that willingness and that ability to, to learn. This is not something that happens in the weeks leading up to starting school and is in fact what the EYFS guides us in from the moment a child begins their early learning journey. And so if we just move on to the next slide. Yes, yeah. sorry Michael. Sorry, no, no, I was just reading a question mm. that's coming in from Sarah, but I'll, I'll slot that okay. in later on. Um, just on the slide there, mm. I, I left it up on the screen for quite a while. If mm. I recall, this is a quote on page seven from that document, and it's from a headmaster. It is, um, yes. And I love this. We yes. always get anxious in terms of do schools expect to focus on cognitive mm -hmm. uh, readiness for school, whatever that may be. And I thought this was really refreshing the first time I read this, that actually their expectation is a well-rounded child with these good levels of development and from that they will then develop an effective learner as they go through school. Absolutely. Thank you, Michael. Um, one of the reasons why I've crammed so many words onto the slide as well in the first place is that I couldn't, I couldn't you cut back it, on yeah. it. No, 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 and there's no need to. So we've talked about the importance of good transition and change management from the outset. The transition to school is something that almost all children, with only some exceptions, experience, and it has a great influence on their progress, their attitude towards learning, and their future schooling. But it's not always a good experience for every child. And at this point, it's a good idea to reflect, if you can remember that far back, Michael, on the experience of starting school for yourself. Um, we won't go there, but I will say it's likely that for, for those of us with the most vivid recollections, they, some of them will be negative. For example, not knowing where the toilet was, feeling lonely, isolated or vulnerable in some way, crying for your mum and dad. And for those of us with older siblings, hearing exaggerated stories of notoriously wicked teachers who just revel in making children's lives miserable. Um, we have moved on over the past 30 years with more children accessing early education and as a consequence being better prepared. Even so, school ready is one thing in terms of their development, but being ready for the experience of school is another matter in terms of the child's ex expectations. Consequently, a child that we believe to be school ready can struggle if they're not prepared for what school will be like. I remember being told to take a paint pot to the sink to wash it and absolutely panicking because we, we, we haven't had sinks in preschool. Fair point. Thank you. Um, Sarah has come in with a question. How will school readiness be affected by DFE's eagerness to bring back baseline assessment? Um, oh, oh, so thank you, Sarah. Thank um, you. <laughs> this, I, there are slides which we come on to this in slightly more detail, but I think I think you might also be referring to the news that was in the in the trade press earlier in the week that the U England has signed up to be mm -hmm. part of the PISA tire uh, testing along with the United States, um, and this will be quite controversial, I think, in terms of how formal assessment is done for children within the earliest foundation stage. And I think the other point that it aligns to from there, and I'm, I know Melanie will come on to this, is that the difficulty of defining school readiness when you don't know what age any particular child may necessarily be going to school. Yes, uh, yes. And I, and I hope people will have seen our responses to, to consultations and press releases that we've made about our concerns over uh, baseline assessment. Thank you, Michael. 
Um, this actually leads us on quite nicely to the, to the next slide um, with regard to key elements for quality transition. Um, Am I behind you? Sorry. Oh, I'm, uh, key elements. Can, yes, sorry, I've rushed ahead. Sorry. That's okay. Um, Went perfectly in rehearsal. <laughs> of course it always does. <laughs> this leads us on nicely to the next point, as I said. Um, keeping the unique child at part of everything that we do. And of course, it's the key person that brings all this together with a special relationship with the child and their parents. The key person is always going to be best placed to support and manage the process of change that transition actually leads to. The coherence and continuity comes from that shared and owned understanding of what school readiness is so that everyone involved is moving at the same pace and towards the same ultimate goal. Um, in the resource pack, I think I could have done a separate webinar just simply on school readiness. So what I've done in, in the resource pack is actually provided further information about how you can come to a shared agreement as a team about what school readiness actually looks like for you, for the parents that you're working with, and of course for the schools in your local community. Um, just to add to that, it's a range of conversations we've had over a number of times with Ofsted, mm. where they understandably, for all the reasons we've mentioned, they do not define what school readiness means. What they want is for each setting to be able to articulate what school readiness means for them. Um, and if you can do that and demonstrate how you live that vision in terms of preparing your children, um, then you will satisfy the Ofsted inspector. Yes, indeed. And, and as I said, I've put together a few guidance notes um, that will be available in the resource pack that can su support you in that process. Sorry, that's an alarm outside. Hopefully not a fire alarm. We should be able to stay put. Okay, so... Looking at the unique child then on the next slide, okay. let's, let's spend some time looking at these things in a little bit more detail. So starting as always with the unique child. We talk constantly about the unique child, but when it comes to starting school, we tend to revert to seeing them as a single cohort, our leavers. And that's not always helpful. This is a good time to talk to parents about how they would like to manage starting school too. What are they saying and doing with their child? Is their child familiar with the school because of an older sibling? How is the intake being managed by the school? For example, half days. What are the questions being asked by the child at home? And crucially, how is the parent answering them? If parents have been saying for a while, oh, he's so ready for school, is this something that your observations and assessment concur with? Or is it something that needs to be discussed further? In my experience, the child that is being described as so ready is often the least prepared. And the challenging behavior that seems to indicate to people that they are ready for school is in fact an indication of the fact they may not have settled in your setting in the first place. And they're going to find that school routine quite hard to manage. Thank you. I mentioned earlier the key person, so again, just coming back to that, the role of the key person is paramount because they are the person that will offer consistency and security during transition. They can be and should be a source of information between all parties, um, and again, that's what develops that coherence and that clear um, idea of what's going to happen. The key person should collate and summarize assessment materials and the paperwork that's to be handed over. And as always, again, we can't say it too often, the key person keeps the individual child at the heart of the process, creating time for the child, the parent, and the school to communicate with each other. In terms of preparing, what we come down to now is some more of the, the practical things that we need to do. Communication, which leads to that shared understanding, sharing our definition of school readiness, as Michael um, spoke about earlier, so that parents understand what it is that you're working towards. Maintaining consistency in the information that is being shared and managing expectations of each other as well. And then, of course, inevitably, there's the paperwork. 
So the key person will have been responsible for compiling and keeping up to date with learning journeys, whether those are electronic or whether they are paper ones, and we know that more and more people are moving over to electronic learning journeys now. Those summative assessments that you will have made over time when the child has been with you, and how you make that final summative assessment that you're preparing to hand on to the school. Making sure that procedures are in place, are shared and understood, again, so that everybody understands what's going to happen. And if you have transition forms, and not everybody does, some people devise their own, some people will use local authority transition forms, but again, making sure that they are completed fully and shared with the relevant people, as in parents, your own records, and the school. Most local authorities, like I said, do have very good examples of transition forms that can be downloaded. And then, in terms of transition procedure, do you have a written transition procedure? It's not a requirement, but I would suggest that it's very helpful to have one. Um, and I've, I've included a template for this as well in the resource pack. See how much you get for your money. More bang for your buck. Um, transition procedures should, at the very least, detail who's going to coordinate the child's transition. As I've already mentioned, it should be the key person. How you work with local schools so that you can develop orientation and share orientation activities. I see Michael's twitching. Have you got there's another question? No, from... no, it's a question to ask yeah. of, of participants. Mm. Um, this, as you say, a lot of this comes down to whether it's communication and effective paperwork in terms of the relationship of the setting with its feeder pre, uh, with its feeder mm. schools. And I would just be curious if people have two seconds to type a, a good, bad, or intermediate mm. response in terms of how they find their relationship with their with their feeder school. Yes, that, that would be really interesting for us to hear. Thank you. Um, what happens if children start part-time? Do you offer places um, for, for children who are at school and also need childcare for the rest of the day? And how would you actually manage that? How are children with additional needs supported? And I'm going to go on and talk about that a little bit more later, actually sharing some of my own experiences with you. What are your processes for leaving? And this is, you know, this is the policy stuff. How, how much notification do you need? Do you re refund deposits? And when are you having lever events? Um, I must admit, I do struggle somewhat with the idea of having graduation ceremonies. Um, and I would, I would throw that out there to you. As like, who, who are you having them for? Who, who do they matter to? Are they most meaningful for you, for the parents? Um, I would, I would imagine that for most children they don't mean an awful lot. Okay, and if we just move on again as we whisk through these slides, and again looking in a little bit more detail about some of the things I've mentioned, some ideas for orientation that school might already have in place or that you might want to share with, with the school. Sharing photographs of the school, arranging visits to the school, invite teachers in to visit as well if they have the time and capacity to do so. It's really helpful. And for children to be able to see the teacher out of that school environment as well is quite re reassuring sometimes. Hold picnics to get children used to a packed lunch, especially with those children that haven't had packed lunches if they've been with you. Promote self-service at lunchtime where you do have lunchtime. Share books and stories about starting school. There are some really good ones out there. Encourage children's independence wherever you can. Things that we do anyway, but just give some focus to that, to thinking of the things that those children, those task children are going to need to be able to do when they get to school. Create a book about your setting with the children and share it with the school. Perhaps the children would like to take it with them on their orientation visits. And a few more on the next slide as well. So I'll just pick mm. up there just in terms of, I've had a few responses. Reagan, first of all, in terms of, our feeder school invites us to all of the stay in plays, which is handy. They also send us copies of letters that have been sent so we can remind parents of events if needed. Thank you, Regan. Brilliant. Um, That's really um, helpful. Sally Ann has said that they are very strong links with both of their schools. And an interesting one from Kelly, um, it's improving change of head. Now, I assume <laughs> that, that means the head teacher at the school. But um, correct me if I'm wrong on that, Kelly. Um, and just one from Sophia, 
We have a really good relationship with our main feeder school and have worked together to organise a very extensive transition programme for our children. We've taken the children to lunch, been on welly walks, invited the lunchtime staff into our setting, borrowed school equipment to get used to it. They've had lots to share play throughout the year with the reception class. That means the teacher is really familiar. That sounds wow. ideal, Sophia, I have to say. And very food orientated. I think it's an ideal oh, way to chat up. Oh, always, always. And how things have changed since I was managing um, a nursery only some 15 years ago and our frustration at the fact that the local schools just didn't want to no, talk to us it, at all. Over my period of time with the yeah. I would suggest that's a big journey as well. So brilliant progress. Um, some more ideas as well, and, and I see that you know the things that are happening out there actually could be easily be added to this list. Letting children create drawings and paintings to take with them on a school visit, including props in your role play, such as lunch trays or book bags. Attending school events with the children, which you've said, letting children accompany staff to drop off and collect children. Encourage older children in out-of-school, if you offer out-of-school facility, to mentor your leavers. You'd be surprised at the problems they can iron out and solve between them when you've got older children mentoring younger ones. And familiarize yourself as well, so that you are talking with, with knowledge and authority about what's happening. Um, and, and the, just a final mention there on that, that a good teacher um, will ensure that displays of children's work, if they have taken it in on the orientation visits, will be there for them to see on their first day. Very reassuring. So moving on to children with special educational needs. Uh, children with SCN will need extra support during transition, and that's something I don't need to tell early years practitioners. But it is something that needs to be discussed. So a few brief pointers here. Making links with the school SENCO. Arrange a meeting, if it hasn't been arranged, between all parties, including the local authority coordinator, and doing that in good time. I recently attended just such a meeting uh, where my daughter-in-law asked me to attend um, with my granddaughter Holly, who has Down syndrome and will be deferring her school place until next year. And we had the meeting several weeks ago now to discuss those arrangements. Um, creating a visual timetable, arranging extra visits, and if the key person, the child's existing key person can go along, then brilliant. And allowing extra time for that handover, for that transition to take place. The meeting, as I said, must be timely. And in some cases, it might be in the best interest of the child for their start date, date to be deferred, but that's got to be for the right reasons, um, for the child's best interest, not because the school isn't ready to receive them. At the meeting, it's important to remember, as, as I observed myself, that parents can be overwhelmed, particularly if their child has a condition that means mainstream school isn't always an option and the fact that they are intending to start mainstream school is something that has been already been given a great deal of thought. If your school has been used, oh, sorry, if your nursery has been using sign along or Macaton, does the school have someone who can use it? If not, can they access that training and will the local authority be supporting them to do so? Will there be access issues and what additional support can the school put into place? What will happen if the child cannot cope with mainstream school in the long term? And I must say that I have heard um, firsthand of um, one of the special needs schools in the area saying that they couldn't guarantee to offer a place to the child with additional needs in the future if they didn't take that place immediately. Really? Really, yes. yes. So just being aware that sometimes Everybody has their own agenda and, and you know, I'm sure the local authority concerned about the lack of places available wanted to get the child in early, but actually school, mainstream school, is the best place for the child at the moment. Um, just picking up mm. on that point, I think obviously we're focusing on the child here. There will be a situation where the setting is a point of support to the parent in that situation as well. Uh, a parent ill-informed, although in my experience children, uh, parents of children with special education needs are extremely good advocates. 
that receiving that information from the professional staff may not feel necessarily confident or in a position to cha challenge yes, that yeah. and that actually one would hope that they feel confident to be able to come to the manager of the setting or the key person to say is that correct and is there a legal responsibility so there will be situations where the support for the parent is as important as it is the support for the child definitely and particularly because parents like all of us have their child's best interests at heart and if you're feeling overwhelmed by the whole experience you start to doubt the decisions that you're making um, so thank you for that and then we come on finally to to the transition form um, and what I just wanted to say here um, just to point out to you it, this is about who does what and if you don't have a transition form that's provided for you by your local authority then these are some of the very basic things that I think need to be in there and again I'm, I'm putting a template into the pack that, that will be available so this is about who hands over what and when and it's the thing that everybody gets a little bit nervous about because of data protection what what can we give to the school what are we allowed to give to the school so at the very least we want the child's details we want their learning journey or record of achievement we want any information from a parent or carer that will support that transition a transition plan if you have one and copies of any IEPs, any looked after child details or a plan for a looked after child, any healthcare plans and any other information that you believe will support that child's transition from your setting to the school and if in doubt I would say you discuss it with the child's parents and ask them if they would rather share the information or if you can hand the, the information across directly and also check on your local authority website as well and see what they're saying about transitions and what should be passed on because believe it or not it does vary between local authorities um, and that actually brings me to the end of, of our very timely and rather brief webinar and it's always so much more that we want to say in these sessions but we do try to keep it to about 30 minutes for a reason um, as we mentioned earlier there is a webinar resource pack available and it will contain a PowerPoint presentation that you can then use to train your staff any staff that haven't been able to attend or you can build on it to facilitate this present presentation during a CPD day that you might have planned for your staff. So there are facilitator notes and links to further reading for each of the subjects that we've covered. Uh, I always try to make clear links to the relevant EYFS and Ofsted inspection criteria which helps to keep us all, foca uh, all focused. There will be templates and other resources as appropriate and I've mentioned some of the ones that I intend to put into this particular resource pack. Now these resource packs are available electronically for just £15 for members, £20 for non-members and we can actually send out paper copies as well but if, if, that's, if that is your need then please just let us know by emailing our training centre or calling them on the number given here. And I think that's where I sign off now, Michael, for the, for the session, unless any more questions well, well, have come in. Thank you, Melanie. That's fascinating. Um, I'll wait for a few minutes to see if there are any other questions or comments. I will just add to another comment that Sophia sent through. Um, sounds ideal. We also have one of our staff in the school on the first day, so that there is a really familiar face in case the children are a bit wobbly. That and sounds brilliant. delightful, Sophia, and I have to say. Brilliant. And, and presumably to support some of the wobbly parents as well outside the school gates because they will inevitably be those yeah. as well. That's uh, fantastic. Um, thank you all um, and for your contributions as well from participants. Um, and, and Sophia just said yes it really does help the parents. Yes. Fant <laughs> fantastic results. Thank you Sophia. Um, I will just um, talk for a couple of seconds whilst if anybody is um, doing their two finger typing with any particular questions. Um, but for those of you who've been with us before, you know I don't artificially extend these sessions. Um, as Mel says, we do, um, we do um, keep it to 30 minutes because of uh, our all attention spans, etc. Um, the other point it does refer to me is that we, we have introduced a situation whereby um, the resource packs are made available to the first five people who 
sign up uh, for the webinar and, uh, attend. and attend. Um, and so I do have that list of five uh, with me. I won't embarrass people by putting it out over the web, but we will make sure free resources are sent to those five. I'm just giving Mel the list from Thank there now. Thank you very much. Um, and from that point of view, I would like to wish you all hopefully a dry evening. Um, those of you who had the first rain in ages. Uh, thank you. Um, I should also be able to say what our next webinar is in September. We're taking August off yes, and are. we are looking to do a focus on one that's come very popular in terms of safeguarding record keeping, getting it right first time. Uh, dates will be confirmed in due course. Um, we won't be having a webinar in August. The recording is available for this as part of the resource pack. I wish you all a good summer. Thank you very much.